we're going to look at, because we've been looking at the life of Abraham in the Bible through this series. Uh, we're coming to the end of that now, so a new series that we're starting. Uh, I'll let you know what that is, but today we look at a very sad chapter in Abraham's life. So I'll say a little prayer that I always say, Alistair Begg said it, so if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. What we know not teach us, what we have not give us, what we are not make us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Abraham becomes a widower, Genesis 23. And the first thing we're going to look at in verses 1 and 2, Sarah dies. Verse 1 begins, Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah, and Sarah died. Sarah lived a grand old age. She lived, uh, obviously, till 127. And she'd been with Abraham all the way through. When Abraham was first called in Genesis 12, she was there. When God called Abraham to leave the land of Ur and take his family, leave those who were behind and make a new start, <coughs> Abraham took Sarah with him. She's been with him through this entire story, through Abraham's falls, through Abraham's highs and lows. She's been there. And now she isn't. Like Abraham, she's a woman of faith with very serious blemishes. Abraham was a man of faith with very serious blemishes. We've, we've talked about them. If you listen to CCP this morning, Simon brought them up. He lied twice. He said Sarah was his sister. Being like a politician, not telling the whole truth. Tell him that he's his sister, but he's his wife, you know. Um, he, he's, they concoct a plan because God's slow and they think it might help God along. Sarah tells him to sleep with her maid, as we call her, but a slave. She used a human being as a breeding machine because she thought God might not keep his promise. So she's a woman of faith with very serious blemishes like Abraham and indeed like you and me. Hebrews, she actually appears, Simone has read part of this, but she actually appears in Hebrews 11 in God's Hall of Fame, as it's called. The, the, um, you know, the Hall of Fame, it's got the stars uh, with famous people's names on. Well, Hebrews 11 is called God's Hall of Fame because the writer to the Hebrews goes right through the Old Testament and says, by faith, this person did a wonderful thing. By faith, that person did an amazing thing. And they did it all by faith because God's amazing. And he says about Sarah, the writer to the Hebrews says, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. Again, the writer is being so kind there because there was time in, a, in the story, as we've looked, that she laughed. She said, that's not going to happen to me. So fa our faith isn't perfect. Our faith will never be perfect. There'll never be a time when we don't need to say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. But we have a weak faith in a great God just like Sarah did. And in this chapter, in these verses, verses 1 and 2, it says, Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Well, I just, when I just described how long Abraham and Sarah had been together, I thought of Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. You know, he died in 2021, and they'd been married since 1947. And she'd been in love with him, they say, from the moment she saw him when she was a teenager. And I just, the morning after the news broke that he was dead, 
I thought, I, I was sat down, you know, we should do pottery, and I thought, what must the Queen feel today? She's known, never known, life without him, really. 70 years with one person, and the morning after she'll wake up and it'll be the first day without him. What must that be like? What must it have been like for poor Abraham? And he mourned her. And as Queen Elizabeth said, the two quotes about mourning, she said one in a Christmas message, I think it was 2018, we mourn because we love. And the other quote is, grief is the price we pay for love. Grief is the price we pay for love. So Abraham mourned. Now, there are some verses that I think are misused in the Bible. Well, there's a lot of verses that are misused in the Bible. The whole book's misused at one point or another in history. But one is, when people mourn, they are, Christians can well-meaningly quote what Paul said, don't mourn as if you don't have hope. And basically, what Brits mean when they say, oh, pull yourself together, keep calm, and carry on, keep going. That's not what Paul meant when he said that. Paul presupposes that you're mourning because he says mourn, but not as those without hope. You're going to find it hard without your loved one. You're going to find it devil. Your whole life changes. Everything. And so when Paul said that, what he meant was, remember, they're with the Lord. One commentator who uh, have, has helped me a great deal, um, Philip Everson on this passage, he says, and I'm going to read the whole quote. There is a false piety, piety means holiness, there is a false piety which thinks it is wrong for a Christian to shed tears and to show signs of mourning. The shedding of tears is actually one of God's amazing safety valves to release the shock of loss. To suppress such emotion is unnatural and dangerous. Those who treat death with a glib, light-hearted way should remember that death is the result of God's curse. It is a separation of what should never have been separated, the soul from the body. On the other hand, Christians do not sorrow like those who have no hope. Tears flow just as Jesus wept at the grave of Lazarus. But we are assured that all who die trusting in Jesus for salvation are present with him in heaven. The two things do exist together. I actually remember one person at uni having a go at people who were mourning. It was when Pope John Paul II died. And uh, she said, why are people crying? He's, they believe he's gone to a better place. They're such hypocrites. And I said, well, suppose your, I said to this person, your best mate is your sister. And she said, yeah. I said, suppose your sister got a job, got a dream job in New York City, which is where she's always wanted to live. And she lives in one of those apartments that are pent. You know, we call them apartments, but they're actually mansions on a single floor, aren't they? And she gets paid $10 million a year. She's going to a better place. She's getting everything she wanted. Would you mourn when she left you at the airport? Knowing your best friend, your sister was now on the other side of an ocean? That's different, she said. No, it's the same thing, isn't it? We mourn because we've lost. We mourn because... Our way of life, everything is going to change. And we mourn ultimately because even though they've gone to a better place, we're going to miss them. I love that phrase, false piety. You know, it's real, it's ridiculous, ridiculous. It's false. It's not holy. And take it from me, I can't cry. I, can't, I wish I could, but I can't. Um, so unfortunately when I'm very upset I, I look like I'm angry and I'm not, I'm just really upset it's awful, I wish I could um, but yeah 
I think tears are, when it does happen, on the rare occasion it happens, I feel like, you know, Braveheart going, FREEDOM! <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, tears are God's way of helping us deal. And grief is, you know, the gift we pay for love, the price we pay for love. So Sarah here has died. <laughs> The next, bit of the, the next part of the chapter, Sarah is buried. Abraham buried her in a Hittite field. That, this is significant. In the ancient world, it is customary if a family emigrate to go back to their homeland. Abraham doesn't do that. That's significant. Abraham's saying, that isn't my homeland anymore. God has called me away from it. This is where God wants me to be. This is the land that God has given me. He's been called away. This is a type of salvation. We're called out of darkness into his marvelous light, like Abraham was. And Abraham says to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and a foreigner. That's what Peter uses about Christians in his first letter in chapter 2. He calls us Sojourners and exiles. Sojourners are like wanderers, like the, the, um, the Native Americans and the Native Australians. Uh, they were tribes that wandered around the land. It's that type of thing. We have no settled abode in this world. You might have an address. You might, have a, you might be a homeowner, but this is not our home. Like Abraham, in this land, he's a sojourner. He's a foreigner. He's a humble man who wants to do right by his neighbours. Very godly man. He knows he's been called away. And he knows now, really, he's at the mercy of this foreign tribe. So he conducts a, big, a business deal and he buys a field off, the, off Ephron, whose field belonged to. Now, Eph, now, again, commentators are divided on this because it's a cultural difference. Some commentators say Ephron was being genuine. He honestly wanted to give him the field. And Abraham said, no, I don't want you to give me the field because you'll have something over me then for the rest of my days. And as we talked in the Bible, it's not just Abraham, it's his seed. But some others say, no, the way, if you've ever been to a Middle Eastern country, they barter with you. Us Brits nearly when that happens I've only been to Turkey once you want to buy something and they offer you a price and you've got to barter them down and they consider it rude if you say no, you know, the British thing even if you're being extortionately overcharged you just still pay it because we're so polite they would find that really insulting so whichever view you take one thing we can know Abraham I believe and I believe this didn't want to have this over his tribe so he wanted to pay full price. And indeed he did it so the Hittite tribe would know that he was genuine. He paid the full price. He never tried to keep a book for himself. He never tried to equivocate. He was honest and open. And he pays the full price in front of witnesses. So everyone knows that this is a genuine, legitimate, honest deal between Abraham and the Hittite tribe, and no one then can question that it was legitimate and that the land belonged to Abraham. He performs his duties with courtesy and in good faith. Abraham is in the world, but not of it. Abraham has his home in another land if you will, the heavenly Jerusalem. We should follow his example. I've just, quote, I've just mentioned this passage, but I'm going to quote it. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, the nations, that's what Gentiles means, so that when they speak of you, against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So Abraham does what's right, he's courteous, he keeps good will, and he gets a land in the land of Canaan, which we're coming on to next, 
as a lamb to bury Sarah, his wife. He's an honourable man. Even in grief, when, when people are grieving, we can make excuses for them. If they're a bit grumpy and don't really want to talk, or snappy, you put it down. Put it down and show them a kindness or cut them some slack. But Abraham doesn't. He goes above and beyond. He does everything in an honourable way. Because he knows he's a foreigner and he knows he has a home in heaven. But this is interesting. Abraham now owns land. Genesis 19 and 20. We'll read them. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. Right through the book of Genesis, this, this cave is mentioned. They keep going back to it. Like I said, it's honorable to go back to where you're from. This is now Abraham's home. The land that God promised to Abraham and the seed, Abraham now owns a plot of it. Legally, legitimately, and unquestionably. God gave him, in his providence, God gave Abraham a little bit of a down payment of the massive inheritance the seed of Abraham would receive. And he buries his wife there, the la in the land that was promised to him by God. God is gracious, kind, faithful. I'll, I'll confess something to you. I don't really like Sarah very much. My sympathies are with Hagar. Why doesn't she, I, I think, why do, sometimes I think, why doesn't she get a nice burial? She might have done, I don't know. Obviously, I'm not happy that Sarah's dead. You know, I'm not happy that people die. I think that's horrible. Um... But God is a God of grace. God is a God of kindness. And God keeps his promises forever. Even to people that you might not like. Even to people you might think don't deserve it. Indeed, none of us deserve it, but you know what I mean. Oh, we all know theologically that none of us deserve God's grace. But we know deep down... Sometimes, if God, there are some people, if God saved them, you'd be really annoyed because you'd think he didn't save the person I wanted to save him. I wanted him to save. He showed mercy on him and not on him. You know, it's, I've thought stuff like that. But God is a God of grace. And we know, as Simon read, and it's in my sermon notes, Abraham buried Sarah, and Sarah died in faith. From Hebrews 11 again, not having received the things promised, they get a little down payment, a field and a cave, but the ultimate promise, they didn't see, they saw it from afar, having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles, there's that phrase on the earth, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Again, look at the catalogue of failings, manipulation and deviousness that we have about Abraham and Sarah. And God says... I'm not ashamed to be called their God. Look at the people who, the, the Christian Hall of Fame, you know, a, a Jewish man who vehemently persecuted the church, who wanted Christians dead, who would spend the rest of his life trying to put the church down, and if he had to kill people, so be it. And then he becomes the writer of most of the New Testament. Paul. Martin Luther, a, a man high up on superstition, who, you know, walked on his knees 
uh, fasted and whipped himself, got a uh, red Romans and the scales fell off his eyes and he knew that you could only be made right with God, justified by faith and faith alone. A man who's, who made a fortune off of slavery, the slave trade in the British Empire days, and threw men over the ship because they were too heavy and the ship wouldn't get there. Sees how horrible what he does, gets saved, repents of his sins and becomes the biggest fighter against slavery and helped get it abolished. And he wrote an amazing hymn called Amazing Grace. John Newton. Chap in Olmskirk, he, he, I mentioned him last year, he did a talk at Bethany on, on Friday night on what is scripture. A terrorist from Northern Ireland. Found guilty, met Christ, pastors a church, and is an evangelist all over Great Britain. Billy McCurry. And a really genuinely lovely, godly man. God is not ashamed to be called their God. That is how amazing amazing grace is. It's so amazing that amazing doesn't cover it, does it? But what is this ultimate promise? You know, Abraham's going to get a land, he's got part of it, but they're looking for a heavenly country. Well, in the fullness of the revelation, in the fullness of scripture, we know Abraham, though he had been promised a land to his seed, we know that ultimately the seed that was promised is the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter said in Acts chapter 3, he says, You, to the Jewish people he's preaching to, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, In you, in your offspring, shall all the families of the earth should be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. How is God going to bless the nations through the seed? The seed is Christ, and he's going to bless us by turning us all from our wicked ways and giving us faith in Jesus Christ. That's the blessing that's going to go over, that has gone, and will continue to go over all the world. Look at the people around us. In this room, people from different parts of Britain, people from different parts of the world, and we all have a common faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. At the conferences we've been to, I spoke to people from the US, from Northern Ireland, from this place and that place, and it was as if I'd known them forever. Paul says in Galatians 3, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, as according to to the promise. You will receive the land and all lands in the new heavens and the new earth when all things are made new. That's your inheritance in Christ. In Christ. Because he is the preeminent one. He is the eternal son of the father who is now crowned with glory and honor. He is the one who will the kingdom of this world, Revelation says, will become the kingdom of the Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and you're going to reign with him. You're going to be glorified with the glory that he has and you're going to see his face and your name's going to be on his forehead. That's why, that's why heaven will be heaven. You know, I read an article by a godly man, Jeff Thomas, and he said, what's heaven going to be like? And he said, the New Testament doesn't tell us very much. And Christians always ask, what's it going to be like? What are we going to be doing? He says, you've missed the point if you're asking that question. How did the New Testament writers talk about heaven? They said it's going to be with Christ. That's why it's heaven. Because we're going to see him in all his glory, majesty, meekness, in all his grace and kindness. He's going to look like a lion and a lamb. All of that. And we're going to be made like him. And so is every Christian who's ever lived. That's why heaven is going to be heaven. One of the Puritans said, Thomas, what, Thomas Goodwin, he said, heaven would be hell if Christ wasn't there. 
It's because Christ is there. And in him, we have all the blessings. So like Abraham, <coughs> just to draw this to a close, Abraham sought a heavenly country. So should we. We are pilgrims and strangers in this world. I love this world. I, I love my country. I love my town. But this isn't our home. Heaven is. And we should set our mind on things that are above. And we realize, that we realize this ultimately by coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you haven't, we would invite you to receive him today as your savior, to receive forgiveness, to receive a new start, and to receive eternal life. And it starts now. So come to him this very day. And again, Abraham conducted himself well among his neighbors. To the glory of God, so should we. Over and over and over again, the New Testament says, conduct yourself properly. Because when people do accuse you, they won't have a leg to stand on because your conduct will be so good. And do it to God's glory. Whether you eat and drink, eat and drink, do it to God's glory. You know, we can't last very long without eating and drinking. Especially in this heat. But even that, that drink of water that you get from the tap or the bottle, because it's so hot, drink it to God's glory. Or in the cup that Francis gives us, we do it to God's glory. And we must always remember, we do know this, but believers are not exempt from the hardships of life. Being a Christian, yeah, there's no prosperity, well, you might be prosperous, but the health, wealth, gospel, it's garbage. Throw it in the bin. If you tithe or if you give to church, God will bless you 30 fold, and this, that, and the other, it's rubbish. Yes, some Christians are rich. Yes, in the Bible, some people are rich. But even they, they have to go through the hardship of life. They have to go through, unless the Lord comes back, we will all die. <coughs> so a good thing to do is use the prayers that the Bible gives us to deal with grief. I actually spoke on one three years ago. The Psalm of Lament, Psalm 6. You know, Psalm 130, Psalm 88. I listened to a sermon on that recently by a pastor in Leeds, you know. Psalm 88, there's no but God. You know, Psalms are, f are full of, sometimes it's terrible things, terrible things, terrible things. But God, praise. Psalm 88 is nothing like that. It's just darkness and misery and coldness. And it's just giving it all to God. Because you can do that. And like Abraham, he forgot what was behind him, so must we. Paul said it, we must forget. In his prison cell, he says, One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's what we want. Then one day... I'll see him as he sees me, face to face, the lover and the loved. No more words, no more sickness, no more sin, no more sorrow, and no more words. The longing will be over. There with my precious Jesus. The full, and we, the church, are the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's the blessed hope. Jesus. Come to him today. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we are so thankful that we have you as our saviour, that we have you as our blessed hope, that we, oh Lord, can look to you in all things, be saved and be kept. You, oh Lord, are so gracious and kind to us. You're not ashamed to be called our God. We who fail every day. But you've chosen us, you've saved us, you've made us holy, you've made us your children, 
and you've given us an eternal home. You've called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We pray, O oh Lord, that the truths that we've spoken about so feebly and so briefly would go deep into our hearts, that we would mourn, but mourn as those who have a blessed hope. And we do pray that you would comfort those who mourn and that we'd remind, be reminded of our duty to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those that weep. Bless us, O oh Lord, as we part now, after we've sung. Give us greater faith, give us greater longing to see you and to have others see you as you are. And we do love you, Lord. You who are the first and the last, the lion and the lamb, the beginning and the end, are all in all, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.